High performance systems. <laughs> Right. And let's get started. Um, welcome to this uh, AC High Performance System session. Uh, we have five papers, um, and we'll start from Matt, uh, who are going to talk about supporting descendants in CMD accelerated JSON path. Uh, Matt is a, a PhD student at Technical University of Munich, and he's interested in making the database system fast. So let's hear about what we can. Uh, what, 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 how we can actually accelerate the JSON parsing. Thank you. Hey, hi, I'll tell you how to make a blazing fast JSON path engine. So first of all, why should we care and what am I talking about? Instead of CIMD, CIMD is a uh, single instruction multiple data. The idea is that we have registers that are wider and we can do many things like compare 32 bytes at the same time in a single CPU cycle. JSON, everyone knows what JSON is, but it's a prevalent data format for web communications, large data sets and log streams. And uh, it's still the dominating factor in many server processing workloads, extracting information from it. To do that, we can use JSON path. It's a standardized recently JSON query language. Uh, the idea is to describe paths in the document that we want to match. So for example, you can extract a number, you can ask for a recursive descent for number, that's the two dots. Or you can write more complex queries like take all phone numbers, use wildcards to extract all elements in a list, and then from that, zoom into the number. To make this more concrete, take this JSON that describes some person. If we ask for child number, it's going to extract this first uh, node at the top level. If you use recursive descent, it's going to find all keys number and extract the, those values. Uh, and you can zoom into the phone numbers, tell it to expand the list with a wildcard and then set all numbers inside of that. So prior work in this area, uh, Cindy Jason is a seminal paper. They made parsing really, really fast. Using Cindy, uh, they achieved gigabyte per second throughputs to build the JSON trees. Uh, Jason Ski, as opposed two years ago, best paper world actually. Uh, they started uh, some of the ideas for using Cindy to skip through JSONs. Uh, crucially, the approach was limited. It lacks descendant support and generic wildcards, which we introduce. In our work, RQ, it's a JSON query CLI and library root in Rust. Production ready, tested. You can use it today. Uh, our contributions are we identify techniques of how to use SIMD to uh, process queries on any unstructured data. It's not only JSON specific with minimal branching and identify opportunities for skipping, expanding on JSON's key ideas. So as the key idea here, do not parse the tree. That kills performance and uses way too much memory. Instead, we're streaming. We take the JSON string and we run Cindy pipelines on it to get max throughput. You need the stack to perform some operations, but it's sparse. You can only push on it if something in the control changes. Uh, and therefore, it is important to separate the SIMD pipeline from the state machine because control flow and branches kill SIMD performance. If you can keep those two separate, you can achieve really massive speed ups, as we'll see. So uh, let's now zoom into the details of how we achieve this. These are trees. This should be uncontroversial. Uh, we can view them as uh, objects have children and they are labeled with the keys. Uh, that they use. Uh, allies can be modeled the same way we just uh, pretend they have uh, labels that are the unique indices. And we put the values as leaves. So if you look at a path in a tree and concatenate all the labels on the path, it's a word. Words are nice. You can run automaton words. So let's just do that. Uh, let's take an automaton that tries to recognize this pattern above, phones, wildcard, number. Uh, nodes. The first state has a self loop. Uh, this corresponds to the recursive descent. And it means that we don't necessarily have to match phones just yet. We can extend the path however long we want and recurse deeper. So if we run this on this tree, 
uh, starting from the initial state, uh, we can go, we are going to pass it, you know, that first fashion, going to number. Uh, this doesn't really do anything for us. But if we go in the other direction, we can match the phones transition. The automaton is non-deterministic, so we're in two states at the same time now. If we go down, we match the wildcard uh, transition. It matches everything, so it's fine. Uh, then if we go to the type node, well, it doesn't match the, the number transition from three. Uh, so the run just kind of dies. And the key moment happens here to continue the DFS and go to the number node that actually matches. We need to recall where we were when we were in the parent and time travel back one step. So we need to somehow remember that when we go up now, we need to go back to the combination of states one, three. Uh, the easiest way to do that is with a stack and just do a tree walk with a, with a stack uh, for the depth first search. And if we do that, now we can go to the number and that actually matches the transition and we emit the value. Uh, and now again, to uh, visit the second element in this list, we have to go up and recall this combination, up, recall this, and now we can follow the same pattern to match the other values. So how to do that quickly? Uh, if we don't have the tree, uh, we achieve that with a combination of very optimized CMD kernels. Uh, we call them classifiers, and those classifying tasks are composable, which which allows this engine to exist. So first of all, we need to classify quoted strings. This is a solved problem by Lanier et al. in CMD JSON. We just use their solution. Then you need Alexa that will find the curly braces and square elements of the of the JSON to actually know where we are going in the tree. And finally, we have two important optimizations that allow us to skip through parts of the tree that are completely relevant and achieve speedups. Uh, the code classifier is the heaviest part of the pipeline. Uh, it needs 30 cycles per a block, which has 32 bytes. Uh, and it's needed almost everywhere. I will show you why in a second. Uh, but we can hot swap classifiers in and out thanks to our architecture. Uh, and that allows us to sometimes not use the quote classifier. So let's look at the classifiers in more detail. For lexing, we need to find those characters. Those are the only characters in the JSON that actually matter for the tree structure. Remember that we're not building the tree. We just have the string. We need to pretend that we know how the tree looks like. To classify this, we, we essentially want a bit mask where every lit bit uh, corresponds to uh, an occurrence of a meaningful character. But if you just very plainly, it doesn't work because some of those characters can be inside strings, as you can see here in the example, and they don't actually matter. They're, they're part of the label, not the structure. So here's where the quote classifier comes into play. We need to find where those quoted sequences are and remove them from the bit mask. The rest uh, can be done really quickly. That's two vectorial lookups, the CMPQ, very fast to cycles per block. If you think about it, that's what, one sixteenth of a cycle per byte. That's extremely fast. Uh, additionally, another optimization, we can actually ignore commas and columns. They don't matter in the most of the JSON, it turns out. Uh, by tweaking the lookup table at runtime, we can just switch them out. Let's talk about two core optimizations. Number one, when starting with a descendant, we can ignore basically all of the JSON until we find the key that we're interested in. What do I mean by that? Presume we are looking for descendants, some key. Anything that happens in the JSON up to up to the appearance of that key doesn't matter for us at all. If we find it, we find the opening brace here. We can just run the engine on that small object and pretend that it's actually the, the entire document. Uh, it's a very simple idea, but very effective. And looking for a key can be done with a simple CMD search algorithm. It's the memmem procedure in libc. Uh, and it's uh, really, really fast because it doesn't actually need the code classifier. We, we don't care about the structure. We only care about finding the labels. Tail skipping is a generalized idea from Jason's key. Uh, previously, we were skipping like the initial parts of the JSON. Here we skip uh, subtrees that we don't really look, uh, want to look at at the tail of execution. So <laughs> the key property of Jason here is that keys are unique. So let's look at this example. I'm looking for .a at the start. 
Uh, if I see the key C, I know that it doesn't match my, my A label that I'm looking for, so I don't care about the tree that's there. I can just skip through it. Uh, then I see A, I actually need to go in and process, in this case, find this end and B. But after that, since keys are unique, I know I'm not going to find another A, so I can just ignore everything going forward. In this case, I can actually just end processing right there. I found everything that I could have. Uh, it's a general uh, property that can be characterized by the shape of the automaton. Uh, if the state has only one meaningful transition, we always skip after we either match it or we don't match it and reject. How do we achieve that? It's another classifier uh, that we call the depth classifier. And the idea is that when we are skipping through an object, we only care uh, where in the tree we are. We don't look at the labels at all. Every time you see an opening, the depth increases by one. Every time you see a closing, a curly brace or square brace, uh, the depth decreases. So we want to skip until we go back to depth zero. Uh, this is not that easy. If you assume that at the start of the block, as in D block, you have depth four, you have to actually look at every occurrence of an opening and a closing to find out where you reach zero. In this case, it's the 37th byte. But so an important observation, if the depth is high enough, uh, it actually doesn't matter what's happening inside because the worst thing that can happen with a given number of openings and closings in the mask cannot bring us to depth zero. So we don't need to actually look at the block. You can just pop count and skip the entire block. And this gives us an important edge of adjacent schemes. Some challenges that we identified is that there seems to not be a good enough CMD abstraction. Compositionality is hard. Compilers very often screw up code generation and cause you to lose like 50% of throughput due to miscompilation. And it's prohibitively complex. Like this engine couldn't have been written by a non-expert, unfortunately. Uh, it seems like we're missing some kind of an abstraction here. You have the approach used here, which is just handwrite intrinsics and special CMD instructions, but that's too concrete and not portable. On the other hand, you can try to rely on compiler auto-vectorization, but it's a black box. It's hard to make the compiler do what you want. Uh, it seems like there should be something in between, like a just tried abstraction. So this is kind of a call to action. Uh, and finally, what we're all waiting for, the experiments. Uh, here are the results. Uh, they are repeatable. You can see blue is us, red is Jason's key. We have passed them due to the depth classifier, the trick of skipping blocks. And very tiny there in gray is JSurfer. It's a well, uh, open source engine in Java. The only one for JSON path that we were able to find that is streaming, doesn't build a tree, but it's very bad. It is like 200 megabytes per second. So it's a non starter. And importantly, the sentence can be used to get massive speed ups. If you can somehow figure out due to knowledge of how a JSON looks that uh, you can replace the initial part of the query with the sentence search, you can make it much more optimized for your use case. And that's all that I wanted to say today. So thank you. The project is open source. I invite you to read the paper and use the app. Questions for the author? All right. Yeah. How would uh, expected labs to be some control for as in uh, intercity system? So, uh, some more contemporary intercity got enough to have a broad web. It is possible, yeah. Uh, so, uh, more contemporary CPUs just get better speed ups. Uh, we use this experiment bench because it's repeatable. It's on the French grid 5000, which is like a scientific network. You can get a box that's just always the same environment. So experiments are repeatable. If you use a more contemporary uh, CPU, those charts just get wider. Like J server stays the same and we get like 30 gigabytes per second on Zen 4, for example. Uh, and additionally, this is for AVX2, which is already kind of old, right? We have AVX512. And the games there are also comparable. Uh, we have more experiments in the in the paper on more test benches. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Um, the second talk.
is from um, Hao Zhou um, uh, from Mflame Tech, and this is going to be the recorded talk. I'm glad to introduce our work on information technologies for low code generation in order to accelerate dense algebra computations. As well as the linear algebra computations are widely used and performance critical, our organizers has provided various SMD extensions to accelerate them. Here, we we'll compare two SMD instructions, band virtual for linear algebra computations. On the left side, the LMP structure operates on inputs with the same data type and vector lengths, and the multiple line and other operation are playing on each same delay. On the left side, the linear instruction has a 16 dollar per data computation in parallel, and its functional equivalent to multiple conventional single instructions combined, shows that it's more complicated and efficient. When it operates on different data types and vector lenses, more importantly, it performs horizontal reduction on left hand endings across adjacent same lengths, allowing the movie to get J. And it's where when you represent a quad gram in multi dimensional factor reflection, distinguishing itself from conventional same distractions by identity. Despite all of these performance advantages, its utilization in values is currently limited. Only value in GM sub of Intel and KL. The performance of automatic code generation tools is also unsatisfying. I would like to write this in English compilers, which target independent and anthropic instructions inside the inmost loop of basic blocks, and not capture the least computation pattern further. As a last resort, we all organizers are entitled to identify specific instruction strings, for example. After vectorizing this loop nest, the compiler can recognize the dark black pattern inside the loop. However, to generate both instructions, the compiler needs to identify 16 independent dark black patterns, which can be easily affected by other pre existing code implementations. Legend is a recent research work expanding the SRP vectorizing technologies to handle the same instructions like when. Essentially, in general, this pattern match based factorizing automatically according to the semantics of the instructions. However, do is limited operation window in basic blocks and the restricted pattern matching rules, writing on the first two general domain code. Furthermore, there are some other tiny based AI combination frameworks such as Unit and AMOS, built up on TBM, which can generate the way code successfully. Very large intensive computation patterns written in advanced space vector languages and requires time consuming search to obtain cohesive results. Targeting these issues, we try to solve the main challenges listed here, as well as cross plan computation pattern cannot be easily captured in a limited local wheel. We we'll firstly consider how to fully capture the needs of the additional opportunities. Besides, because wireless and people operators are sensitive to coexisting existing organizations and where they generate unexpected results, we consider that how to smartly cooperate with loop transformations in a more efficient manner than auditory frameworks. Eventually, we are looking for a more robust, sustainable, effective, and efficient combination approach. Our key idea is to explore the Windows optimization opportunities at a first grand and higher scope rather than the instruction springs inside the inmost loop or basic blocks. Meanwhile, we have used the highlight features of the entire nest, such as new structure and random access behavior, to cooperate with code transformations and augmentations. We also introduced a normal to normal estimate performance benefits 
on different co-general strategies for removing mostly search. Our brain learning in these three stages. The group of are essentially a vendor tests. During the first stage, the examines loops text structure and loop out statement to check where this computation pattern exists. It then analyzes input and output pattern access behavior to critical optimizations considered later. By the range semantics, we transform input code from formally to generate a perfect blast and serve as input of the next stage. In the second stage, it will finalize the mind perfectly nest according to the different group iteration binary control issues. The guarantee of those partners and performance are generally called in considering different optimization strategies and choose streamlining the population of Windows inputs and dedicate Windows execution legacy. It's used to compare these code transformation strategies and select the most important one. During the last stage, it means when we go here, we use the metrics about the multiply thermal as an example to show how we extract optimization candidate at stage one. Well. We firstly check the computer pattern by identifying the loop statement that represents a sequence of limited on high and scale operations. Then we check whether the limited attacks means Wayne's requirements. But in the way, we check how we the reduction pattern and we can put a little bit of related to a pattern function. Which only exists in the index of the input terminals. We then found how the information reflecting memory access behavior of the processed array, such as memory access table, which will be delivered and was an array that they were used during computation. So the GM record applied information about the arrays and the delivers is given in the system. By organization candidates, we will criticize incorrect request with location, subdivision, and unswitching to generate perfectly nested loops, which facilitate the transformation of an intermediate stage. With the final organization candidate, we consider that our script model is the perfect request, creating optimally sized innermost loops for awaiting instruction substitution. We call it loop iterator binding because it binds the loop iterator of the input loop nest and the wing semantics. It essentially represents specific loop timing and switching strategy. The GMW kernel will always bind loop iterator J to JJ and they will also control the after detection behavior. But for Wayne's loop iterator binding, it has two different binding options. So the option show on the left by both A and J to JJ. And then the root JJ is tied with a time factor of 16 multiplied by which equals 60 bit. To ensure the correctness of the time value, further reduction of any subgroup factor is removed. So it will the final result they will have a We call it tail reduction. The second option show on the right I to I and J to JJ, and therefore the loops I and JJ are tied with 16 and 4 respectively. To carry the graph of input access into the famous input vector, additional overlapping operations are necessary. The graph of the link has ever been given a sense of the graphs. The interbinary operations, the more they generate the inmost group, will be replaced with one of the instruction instance. Given the metering binding configuration, we also don't want to break down the operation to transform the inconsecutive memory access into consecutive ones. Meanwhile, we consider the planning loop that we are in general to be two greater readers and IP. The other factors are decided with the rights to pressure level that estimate rights to usage to avoid rights disputes and recover. We use that optimal that evaluates the elements of load, spell, data organization, and tail reduction. Knowledge for each main instance. We use it to select the most appropriate value between binding configuration and optimization strategy. Here, we demonstrate how different programs are generated under different configurations. 
as shown earlier, if you align those I and J to JJ, we will be at this time of the nest. We are know the loop JJ and I will jam the loop I with a factor of two. That will be a full link in that instance inside the infinite loop. In one thing, I will use a while and increase the IP. And so you can tell the action code accordingly where it will turn the number of the code. Similarly, I will play to I and J to JJ for general this type of next. After you are ready and I will jam as fact on two, we will have a very mini gridland instance in the inverse loop to improve the efficiency of memory access on um, input apps. We open data organizations and add a temporary lab to carry the reorganized data, which can now be efficiently accessed with backup loads. We call that we use a cross level of rebalance different code generation strategies. Then the the most favorable conversion is generated eventually. When we implemented a contract and an we use the going to download JS project as a front end to generate the contents a final code, which is formatted for us to extract bring something of the shell to date. And of course, we're view. The environment is eventually embedded to a and built into bank. We have an approach against industry problems, research workers, Intel, MKR, and Ready, and the innovation frameworks. Here, we give some results included in paper. Our framework, EVU, are famous after industry colleagues and research workers. And on average, it achieves 89% of MKL's performance and 67% of Ruby's machine peak. To conclude this talk, we want to highlight that online data in many can be beneficial for code generation of other similar type of structure, such as Intel's more recent BS16 extension and instructions of other platforms. The two iterative binding configurations introduced in our paper are available to design new patterns in existing autonomy tools. Besides dense linear algorithm, efficient linear utilization might also be profitable for sparse linear algorithm computations. That will be the end of this talk. Thanks so much for your attention. Uh, let us check whether the author is on Zoom. Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, can you hear us? Yes, I can. All right. So, question from the audience. Okay. Then uh, let me ask one question. Um, when we look at the like the final result, I can see that uh, you are better. Uh, excuse me, uh, I, I can only hear you say like when you look at the final result and uh, I cannot hear the things after. I I do, would you mind to repeat the question? Yeah. Sure. So I just wanted to understand um, what is the kind of best scenario for your system to work better than the prior work um, and what are the kind of worst scenarios that you might not be? So um, can you comment on that? All right. Yes, sure. Uh, actually, this work is uh, mainly on working on like a coarse grain, like uh, multi-level vector extraction, like Vini instructions, and of, of course, more advanced uh, BF16, uh, CMD instructions, which is uh, diff different uh, compared to the conventional CMD instructions only focus on one level uh, loop, uh, loop abstraction. So, uh, for this work, we actually, uh, uh, as you can see from the uh, proof of results, uh, because Wayne instruction is mainly designed to uh, accelerate uh, linear algebra because it performs uh, dot product, 16 dot products in parallel. So uh, this instruction is actually very uh, efficient when you uh, use it to uh, accelerate uh, algebra, a linear algebra computation like GMM and GMV. So uh, uh, like the result shows, we evaluate uh, uh, some like uh, representative uh, linear operate, uh, 
algebra kernels and also some kernels from uh, DNs like uh, MathMall or MathMall fused with uh, Belt S, uh, this kind of uh, kernels. So uh, under this scenario, our work can perform better than uh, the industry compilers and also some uh, uh, academic work on simulation for uh, uh, automatization, something like that. Uh, because, uh, I, but I, I do feel like this work can be uh, more useful if there are more uh, coarse grained vector extraction uh, coming up in more recent uh, CPUs or even uh, DSA uh, accelerators. So uh, currently, uh, we only target on this uh, uh, bin instruction. We have one question. Um, hi, I appreciate. Okay, at your paper, uh, demo. all your benchmark, you did not quite talk about correctness and accuracy verification. Uh, however, you involve some loop unrolling and loop techniques. So did you get any accuracy testing on, say, your feed forward? Um, uh, you mean uh, tested the whole uh, for the accuracy of the AI yeah. vector, right? Yeah, so tested the, the accuracy for your... Yeah. Uh, uh, the currently, we're using... Uh, I mean, I know. Uh, uh, for In the paper, we'll only include the performance results, but we guarantee the correctness of the results uh, because we only uh, work on the uh, DN uh, uh, inference benchmarks, like uh, bird base benchmarks using the paper, and we uh, did check the correctness of the answer, uh, the results. We guarantee, so uh, yeah. You guarantee the accuracy does not drop after applying your technique, uh, optimization techniques? Yes, we, because we uh, have some constraints like the input and the output, we only use this winning instruction to accelerate uh, the applications uh, without any accuracy drops for this scenario, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you thank so much. Speaker again. No, our first speaker. Okay, so our first speaker is George uh, Biswas. Uh, uh, he is a postdoc at uh, Imperial, uh, Imperial, I'm sorry, Imperial Ch uh, College London. Um, and he is going to talk about his paper a shared compilation stack for distributed memory parallelism in stencil DSLs. Thank you. Check one, two. Okay, hi from my side. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm going to be presenting our paper on a shared compilation stack for distributed memory parallelism in stencil domain specific languages, primarily authored by myself, Anton Lidike, Emilia Bauer, and Nick Brown, and co authored from a lot of other guys, great guys from the University of Cambridge, uh, Berlin, Edinburgh, and Imperial. So, the problem we're trying to address in this uh, uh, work is mainly the monolithic nature of development in domain-specific languages, more specifically uh, targeting a specific uh, domain in computational science, which has to do about finite difference stencil computations. All of these languages are tailored to the specific domain. However, uh, after lowering away the domain-specific information, developers usually implement a lot of generic compilation passes, a lot of optimizations that have to do with uh, general purpose optimizations for high-performance computing. This often leads to a lot of, uh, you know, community disjoint uh, nature, uh, like knowledge is not shared and uh, people keep reinventing the wheel for a number of cases. Uh, since in this uh, talk, we aim to only focus on finite difference uh, stencil DSLs, I'm going to spend a few seconds uh, introducing what is this uh, for the whole of the audience. Uh, usually, most of these compilers start from some high level uh, symbolic abstraction and so using some uh, numerical solution for like for example using finite difference in order to solve this to approximate these equations they end up representing computations using uh, an intermediate representation for loops uh, 
properties after analysis and mathematic uh, operations. And also, you know, they apply in this a lot of optimizations, loop related ones, flow producing ones, and target specific ones, as you can see on the right hand side of this uh, of this uh, slide. So what we are trying to do in this work is to tailor the widely adopted MLR framework uh, specifically for this uh, specific domain. So MLR has proven itself to be a great tool, uh, a unified AR, customizable, extendable support from the community and able to help us address some concerns like composability, uh, interoperability, which has proven to be especially successful in the ML community and provide us with uh, all the necessary tools in order to be able to to keep the communities together, have longevity and maintainability. For a lot of these stencil DSLs that over the years, some of them have really been uh, extinct because they end up in the drawer of the desks and people don't use them anymore. But since MLR has proven itself very good, however, it's not there yet in terms of connecting this with high performance computing for the traditional computational science domains. So in order to address the gap, this gap, we introduce some key high performance computing abstractions, mainly a static single assignment di dialect for distributed for automated domain decomposition. Another one for uh, message passing, which is upstream to MLIR, thanks to Anton, who is somewhere in this room. And uh, a shared compilation stack for these two DSLs, which uh, it's important to mention that uh, they're not uh, yet another stencil tool as you may see in the literature, but are indeed used from a lot of people in academia and industry uh, for seismic imaging, medical imaging, computational fluid dynamics, and weather and climate modeling. Uh, the performance evaluation will show at the end shows that we really did some highly competitive distributed memory performance solvers and added unlocked support for new target and hardware. So in order to address this, we started by lifting MLIR to a Python uh, level using a framework called XDSL developed from originally from the University of Edinburgh, which is a Python native uh, SSA compiler framework using the concepts of, IR, of uh, regions and SSA and providing the opportunity for users not only to mix the already defined IRs, but also add customizable and extended ones. So they bring all these benefits that MLIR has to bring up to the Python level in order so people in uh, Python domain specific languages to be able to communicate with it in a better user way. It's open source available online. You can pip install it, join the XDSL uh, Zulip chat community and talk to us. There's an active contributor community and uh, we're open source, of course. There's a lot of, we're trying to do our best to have quality uh, of code with CI, CD and everything around. If you're more interested in this, check out this publication from Matthew Fer on site compilation with uh, XDSL. So the next step we started in order not to reinvent the wheel was we used the stencil dialect from uh, a paper in 2021 published in ACM TACO, where uh, this dialect helping to, for example, build all the necessary semantics for the data flow and neighboring accesses in stencils. You can see on the right-hand side, a simple one-dimensional three-point Jacobi stencil of uh, showing how you can, uh, um, the, the, the iteration style and the accesses of the stencil update. And uh, after this could be expressed in this way, the automatic lowers to a fine standard control flow and standard dialects in the MLIR with some lines of code. We're able to support automatic lowering to the GPU direct and getting for free the ROCM and uh, CUDA backends. Order to support distributed scaling for CPUs. Of course, this is open source development online as well. The key HP changes origins of the regions that you want to describe. Taking as arguments memory uh, memory or memory only to describe the communication patterns we want, but then after doing the necessary lowerings, we want to use MPI dial message passing in the face. So the message passing IR and the dialect uh, is supporting relations that are supported, like the com rank, uh, init, op, finalize. Uh, receive, sense, and receive, and uh, it's lowered to 
TI lab records. It's important to note here that since LLVM has no intrinsic um, notion of MPI, this is lower to LLVM dot func to the fun. Okay, we should also mention. Mentioned that uh, currently it only supports MPI C8 and later it will be around for uh, chatting. So, next, let's see some uh, uh, example of the whole pipelining to go from the stencil to MPI Delect. Here we have highlighted details on the data that is being operated on with the blue color. For uh, one dimensional where we apply a stencil computation, you can see with the green color the pattern accessing. The right only area of 120 and back to the original domain without caring about the left. This information is used to automatically do the domain decomposition here, where you can see the shape and hollow information being loaded here in two ranks, where we take the domain to and we add the necessary points that need for the interaction for the hollow exchanges. Later on, this is automatic lower to the MPI level IR, where you can see with the yellow color the communication related information, such as the MPI rank, the destinations are there. Of course, this is just the code for uh, the few details. In terms of uh, memory references, and uh, we can see how at every level of abstraction so showing this for the whole uh, pipeline of our shared combined infrastructure in this picture you can see that uh, the grayed out background area is the whole of the shared compilation infrastructure that was implemented uh, it contains not only the predefined dialects of mlir like the reef built-in funk and standard control flow that have been used but also the customized ones and uh, this had to go from like a whole pipeline going from symbolic mathematical abstractions so that the users, mathematicians, physicists just describe the partial differential equations in symbolic notation and get out of the box lowerings to lots of targets to unlock optimizations and uh, multi-node CPU as well and new targets. Uh, of course, performance is not there yet for all the targets, but we're working on it. We're trying to improve. Uh, but the important thing to notice is that Performance here is not the, let's say, performance is not the real motivation. Sharing is the real motivation. And performance is the, the cherry on the cake. Performance is like a small present at the end. We're trying to do something bigger than that and uh, save a lot of people from reinventing the wheel as much as we can. I have selected some results to show uh, using from the beta coming mainly from the wave propagation uh, kernels and uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, some hidden wave kernels. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see a single node AMD EPIC using eight MPI ranks, so one MPI rank per NUMA node of this machine, 16 open MP threads. Uh, the, you can see the size on the left-hand side. Uh, the 3D benchmarks didn't really score as well as the 2D ones. Uh, we really like some good performance analysis here to provide more insights on why it's happening. We aim to do that soon in the future. And uh, what we can see is that the DMP and the MPI dialect, in terms of the communication, they are still keeping the trend uh, for experiments that you can see have the, the red box on the left-hand side. So trying this to scale on 128 nodes, almost like 16,384 cores for problems really used in uh, industry, uh, looks like that our abstractions are, are, are lovely. And uh, finally, you just get a CUDA backend for free. <laughs> And compared to the Open MP, Open ECC, sorry, uh, already supported thing in uh, in the Devito language, you can see we get for free like a fifty or seventy percent uh, speed up for the three D kernels at the, at the rightmost uh, place of these uh, last columns here. Uh, the other DSL, which is used in uh, uh, in UK for a lot of weather and climate forecasting. Uh, have some more uh, experiments here, which I'm not the expert to talk more about that. They have the Piazic and Williams advection and the Nemo Tracer advection. Again, a single note on the left hand side. Uh, you can see that the XDSL uh, light green scores really well and the, compared to the previous implementation existing of different compilers. Uh, the same for uh, the V100, you can see some really great speed ups. However, uh, the, the the tracer advection and the passing and Williams and uh, VR hundred were not like 
super optimized kernels there. And uh, at the right hand side, the two plots on the right hand side, you cannot see uh, a comparison because this is something that was not supported before. So just for free, you get the domain decomposition and the MPI scaling these experiments to high number of nodes. Of course, you can some break down mainly to the small problem size used in distributions. You can see on the left hand side of the screen. Uh, we need to work a bit on performance analysis. Uh, we can do more computation communication schemes at the DMP dialect using the swap operation and uh, doing some better high level, more algorithmic uh, improvements. We're trying from the DeVito side to address more complex wave propagation kernels used in imaging, uh, mostly isotropic elastic and isotropic uh, acoustic waves. Uh, all these are used in real-life simulation benchmarks. Uh, to be honest, it's not just paper benchmarks. There are stuff that people really use for real science out there. And uh, all our work is open source, available online. All forks of these works, the XDSL, again, install it. Feel free to chat with us. I'm around in this conference with uh, Anton Lideke, our uh, collaborator and great author of this paper. I will be happy for a chat. Uh, Thank you very much. And uh, the, the message I want to end up is that building abstractions is great. Sharing them with everyone is better. Thank you. Question from audience. Thanks, super cool work. This is Julian from Codeplay. Uh, my question is, um, so it looks like you are building the same dialect in XDSL and also in MLIR. Um, would it be, why is it better than just having like Python bindings for an existing dialect in MLIR? Uh, so instead of man maintaining the dialect on in both frameworks, why not just have it uh, on the MLIR side and then use Python bindings um, to interface with Python? I have to say that XBSL is like a Python binding. I mean, I, I like to say this is a Python globally. Uh, so I'm not sure I can, uh, I can really distinguish between why that would be better, to be honest. Uh, this approach is where, uh, maybe I don't need to Yeah, so basically, um, XDFL is MLIR re-implemented in Python, but um, the actual, like, interesting abstraction are the IR. Mm -hmm. And what we did is we implemented the operation that we presented first in XDFL to prototype, and then the stuff that we saw worked, and that is like actually usable for a bunch of other people, we started up streaming. And so um, it's it's not duplicating uh, the work. It's kind of like having a prototyping tool and then being able to like extract the useful stuff from them. Yeah, makes sense. But the active and MLI are possibly possible. So you can go from active to MLI back to the installation. Thanks. Can we make the PNL short? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, please don't take this as a, a criticism of the paper. It's more me trying to figure things out. I, I've been very confused by exactly what the benefit of MLIR is in some of these uh, situations. In particular, it seems to me like because it doesn't, there's no semantics attached to it that it's unclear why you are able to reuse dialects without um having semantic shift in what your your constructs mean say over time or across different projects is there some way this is accounted for or is my impression of that accurate thanks basically the semantics are part of the so you represent, oh, I want to exchange this memory with someone? Sure, I guess that's overcomplete with optimizations and with different targets. So there's no reason that all of those would coincide, for instance, that they would have the same semantics. Like all of those imply multiple potentially conflicting semantics. Button to get different results when you compile for different things, right?
right? Our fourth speaker is uh, Ahmad uh, from University of Michigan, um, and he's a six-year PhD student uh, on the job market for industry. So please uh, start him as the talk. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm super excited to be here. So in our work, we optimize SLAM. What is SLAM? SLAM stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. And it's what does head tracking in autonomous navigation and in AR VR headsets. So let's look at how SLAM actually works and does this tracking with you know, kind of a real example. So here on the left, we have the inputs to SLAM. We have the left and the right camera view, and we have an IMU, which is a motion sensor. It takes in, it provides linear acceleration and angular velocity. And on the right here, we can see that it's mapping out a room and figuring out when each camera frame comes in, where is the camera facing and where is it actually in the room? And kind of the key thing that is important here is that whenever we get a frame in, we kind of take the frame and we summarize it into a sparse set of key points. And then we compute the pose of the camera relative to where these key points are. And the thing about SLAM is we have to run it in real time on these really compute constrained embedded systems. And the implications of this are that the amount of computation you have actually really affects your accuracy. On the left here, we have the ground truth trajectory from a motion capture system. And we want our SLAM to match this as closely as possible. And when we run on the desktop, you know, we can. We can see that they're basically almost the same. There are some small differences, but it's very good. But when we run on the Raspberry Pi, it's a bit of a mess. And kind of the reason for this is the Raspberry Pi just doesn't have the amount of computation in order to get good quality at very low latency. And what this means is that's to do things like drop frames or cut optimization iterations short before they converge. And this is gonna cause you to get motion sick if you're wearing a VR headset or your robot to get really confused if you're doing navigation. What we want is something like Slim Slam where we slim slam and get a really accurate trajectory with a really constrained computation budget. It's okay. How do we actually reduce computation in Slam? Well, it turns out SLAM has a ton of parameters, tens to hundreds of parameters that trade off performance and quality. This is stuff like frame rate. You can kind of imagine, you know, the more often you take images of the environment, the better your accuracy is gonna be, but the more computation you're gonna have to do. Same thing with the number of key points you're tracking in the environment. And there are so, so many more, a couple of which I've just put here. The second thing about SLAM is that these parameters are usually statically parameterized for the worst case input. So whether the input's easy or whether it's hard, we're just using the same parameters the whole time. So it's got to deal with everything, you know? And instead, if we do something like specialize the parameters to the situation, maybe we can save some computation. So, okay, let's say we specialize the parameters to the computation. How much can we actually get? On the y-axis here, we have the compute time improvement. And on the x-axis, we have different sequences from a data set. And what we did was we used an auto-tuning framework called Hypermapper to kind of figure out what is the best parameters for each input sequence. And whenever we do that, we find that on average, we can get like a 5x speed up with basically the same parameters at, or basically the same uh, quality as the desktop default parameters. And you know, the good news is, you know, we don't have to make static decisions. We don't have to make one decision for each sequence. And even with just making static decisions, there's so much opportunity so we can get even more with more fine-grained dynamic decisions. It's all right. If there's so much opportunity, why doesn't everyone just do this? And it turns out that it's it's hard. Uh, you know, predicting how changing these parameters at runtime is going to actually affect your application, you know, is hard. And also, if you mess it up, you know, and you destroy your map or you lose tracking, sometimes that's just it. 
You just have to throw away everything you did and start over. The other thing here is that the metrics that you use to figure out, hey, what adaptation should I actually make should be really cheap to collect. Things like figuring out, hey, is my image blurred? Is the lighting bad? How much scene change do I have? Sometimes these could be hard to collect. And we really want something that's just cheap or already there. It's all right. How do prior works do this dynamic adaptation? What they do is they treat Slam like a black box. And we have the camera and IMU images come into their module. They make some sort of decision and then broadcast that decision to all the parameters at the same time, you know, and kind of make a one size fits all decision. And what a control strategy like this may look like is let's say the user or the robot is moving very slowly. You know, we'll use the cheapest parameters. If it's moving very fast, we use the most expensive parameters. But the kicker here is that how fast is too fast and how slow is too slow? How are our parameters actually affecting the SLAM algorithm? How do we know when we've gone too far? So what we do with Slim Slam is we take a white box approach. We find that if you look inside of Slam, it's actually you know, very modular and broken down into tasks. And each of these tasks actually correspond pretty well to a subset of parameters. And by kind of using the intermediate outputs and the state of each of these tasks, we can kind of use them to inform per parameter decisions so we can tailor kind of the decision to each specific parameter. So what we have is a bit of a feedback loop. We change the parameters, the parameters affect SLAM, and then SLAM is gonna do its computation, generate some state, and then tell the decision-making, you know, were we too conservative or were we too aggressive? So this is all very high level and abstract. Let's look at a very concrete example. So for SLAM SLAM, we kind of have this outline, this framework where we do some optimization when we detect some situation with a metric. And these are the main three optimizations that we do. We skip frames, we use fewer key points, and we ignore the right stereo view. You know, for time reasons, we're going to focus on this middle one, where you know, we track less key points when we decide that our current key points are very informative. And you know, as a proxy for informativeness, we use key point depth. I think I want to mention here is that these metrics are already there. The SLAM algorithm computes them as a bright product of doing business. All we're doing is looking at them. So, okay. I'm telling you that near key points are more informative. Why does this make sense? So what we're doing when we take a camera image is we take a 3D point and we project it onto a 2D frame. And when we do this, we lose some information, but since we have stereo camera configurations, we can then do triangulation and recover some of the information that was lost. And whenever we're doing triangulation, we want as diverse views as possible because you know, if the views are the same, they're not really adding extra information. And it turns out when key points are very far, the left and the right cameras basically see the same thing. They're not adding that much information so the uncertainty from triangulation is super high. Whereas when we have near key points, the views are very diverse and the points are actually much more informative. Okay, so that means what we can do is, you know, at low depths, our key points are gonna be very informative. So we can track fewer of them because we already have all the information we need. That's awesome. But then you say, hey, Armand, let's say my depth is high. Well, what do I do then, you know? How do I make sure I meet my deadlines? And you know, that's a really good question. <laughs> Unfortunately, we just can't you know, tell the user, hey, if you put your VR headset on the table, we'll promise we'll track it for zero power. Um, so we talk more about that in the paper. So OK, as part of Slim Slam, we evaluate on multiple different platforms that Slam usually runs on. And we evaluate Slam on a state-of-the-art Slam algorithm called HiveBIO. And we compare it to another state-of-the-art algorithm, which has really good accuracy as well. 
All of our experiments in this presentation are running on the Raspberry Pi because we want to show how well does Slim Slam actually do on a really constrained computational platform. So, okay, we've got this graph here that shows error and execution time. Execution time is on the x-axis. You know, frames come in for this data set, these data sets every 50 milliseconds. So we want to be to the left of this dotted line in order to be real time. At the same time, we want our error to be as low as possible in order to have good tracking. And what we can see is that for the default desktop configuration, we have pretty good error, but we're 4x slower than real time. We can use the static Raspberry Pi configuration that the authors provide. You know, this is real time, but the error is super terrible. With slow great times to reduce computation while still meeting our deadlines. And this is able to allow us to run on real time, in real time on a Raspberry Pi. The art slam algorithm, you know, the quality that we can get with Slim Slam is still state of the art because we're kind of taking this, you know, really expensive slam algorithm and finding how best we can make it cheap. So our accuracy ceiling is really high. So to kind of summarize here, accurate slam in real time is really challenging. And the way we kind of tackle this problem is by dynamically adapting these slam parameters using feedback from the slam state. The slam state tells us when we're being too aggressive and when we're being too conservative. Slim Slam allows us to get really high speed ups over a desktop while enabling really accurate Slam on a Raspberry Pi. I'm on the industry job market. So if you're hiring, let's chat. And I hope you enjoyed listening to the talk as much as I did giving it. Oof. Hey, thank you for the talk. Um, so um, uh, just one question on the SLAM uh, tracking uh, algorithm. Um, so you're doing VIO, which is, uh, as I understand, it's uh, the quality of tracking is kind of related to the number of key points you use uh, in the tracking. And for example, will will a scene like, uh, like this is going to affect the, uh, for example, if you put the headset on the table, then you suddenly move it. Then according to your algorithm, when you it's on the table and it's stable, you're not using that much uh, key points, but if you suddenly move it, then it, the the motion will probably uh, requires more key points. So does like the sudden movement will affect the tracking quality of your algorithm? Yeah. So this is actually a really important case. But instead of looking at motion, we're looking at hey, how fast is the velocity? We actually look at the actual key points because what's important is how long have these key points been around, not how fast are we moving the camera. So. By looking at the key point age, we can really deal with these kind of fast motions because you know we can see when the slam algorithm is losing them and be conservative. And when it's keeping them, we can stay aggressive. I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the author. And then Our uh, last talk is going to be from uh, Yan Su uh, from North, uh, Northwestern University. Uh, the title is Compiling Group Based Message Catalysis for Irregular Marketing. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for coming. I'm Yan Su from the Arcana Group at Northwestern University, presenting Compiling Group Based Message Catalysis for Irregular Codes. So uh, multi-core systems are the mainstream. Uh, whatever devices you're running is powered by multi-core chips. So to utilize multi-core systems, um, many program languages are introduced, uh, such as OpenMP. So these parallel program languages offer programmers the capability to express uh, logical parallelism by a model called a fork-joint parallelism. Uh, so in fork-joint parallelism, uh, the main task is divided into subtasks. And uh, after hitting a fork point, and these subtasks can run in parallel. And after they finish, all subtasks are synchronized. Uh, at the join point. So uh, let's take a simple program that is written in this fork join uh, language constructs. 
uh, and which process a matrix. So uh, our, it's a nested loop, which go through a matrix, uh, it pro go through every row of the matrix, uh, performing some initial work, then go through every element of the uh, uh, ele uh, element of the row, and then in the end, it writes the results. So how does a compiler uh, effectively uh, translate this uh, program for parallel execution? Well, if a compiler generates parallel tasks for each uh, processing every element, the parallelism overhead simply uh, skyrocketed. It's too much. So a better way for compiler to do it is by coursing a task. Uh, for instance, instead of processing every element of the matrix, you process it every row of the matrix. So this process that balances the parallelism overhead and performance by choosing the size of parallel tasks is called granularity control. OK. So for a dense matrix, where like we process every row of the matrix, have a homogeneous amount of computation, uh, which we refer, we refer to as the workload being right. But the problem the problem is, however, we have workloads that are irregular, such as sparse matrix. Uh, oh, therefore, in this case, a computation. So uh, um, it turns out that irregular workloads are quite common uh, in nowadays. Is uh, applications, uh, for instance, since amount of parallelism. However, using static granularity control decisions uh, often give you suboptimal uh, performance. So what you can have uh, right now, if you want to, if you are an uh, OpenMP developer, you can choose between different static dynamic, but the problem with it, uh, you also have to manually tell compiler which loop you want to parallelize, but As an alternative, which is called Herbie scheduling, that was proposed uh, by Akar uh, back in 2018 in PLDR paper, that uh, provides automatic granularity control and performance guarantees for irregular folks. Uh, the problem with Herbie scheduling is that there's no uh, ex Though it's execution models, uh, it's a trip uh, implementation, it's not. Not, uh, which I will go through in the later slides. So using Harpy scheduling, you have to spend a huge amount of time um, in the manual implementing every detail of Harpy scheduling. So leave Harpy scheduling uh, far from being practical, uh, far from being pra uh, practical for our day to day. Uh, so this is our work. Our work aims to bridge this gap. And the first paper that introduced a compiler that automates the code generation for hard MPQ, uh, which we call HPC, uh, uh, short for Harpy Compiler. Uh, of the results, how HPC performance uh, when target uh, against the state-of-the-art granularity can be dynamic in this case. Uh, and we have we are 1.5 uh, 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 faster than that. And this is after evaluating uh, a bunch of uh, workloads uh, and selecting benchmarks from both uh, sparse or results show that the effectiveness of HBC in targeting irregular workloads. So I just told you that there is an automatic uh, uh, transformation for Harvey scheduling, but I have not explained what Harvey scheduling actually is. So uh, so I'm going to complain. Uh, I'm going to use the same example for now. Uh, to explain that. So hobby scheduling does not generate parallelism statically, making static, uh, however, it generates parallelism dynamically. So in hobby scheduling, uh, in the beginning, processing the whole matrix is represented as a single task. Uh, this is called the sequential start uh, of scheduling. Um, so so uh, the parallelism in hobby scheduling is generated by this recurring event called heartbeat that come as a constant interval. Um, um, so. Uh, let's say using our program after processing three elements of the matrix, um, we got a heartbeat. Uh, so now we are going to uh, generate parallelism. How it is done? It is by splitting uh, the re uh, remaining out, uh, uh, work following an outer loop uh, first policy by splitting the loop, uh, loop iterations into uh, equally half. Uh, this is called the outer loop first policy. So now instead of one task, we have two tasks which can run in parallel. And the same execution model applies on the uh, uh, keep uh, applying 
but keep running. They, they run in parallel. They got the heartbeat. And we further split uh, into more tasks. So we continue this process until all the tasks uh, either no longer can be uh, split or the task finished uh, within the next arrival of heartbeats. And it's, uh, so uh, the key idea with heartbeat scheduling is um, amortization uh, is because you always do the sequential work first, then you, you pay the parallelism overhead such that the overhead can amortize over the work you adopt. This is how you achieve um, uh, performance guarantees. So uh, heartbeat scheduling, is, the idea is quite simple, but its implementation is complex. The reason is uh, at the program runtime, instead of we have to invoke tasks that are heterogeneous. Here's what I mean. Um, so normally when the compiler tried to parallelize a loop, uh, it first by uh, it first outlined the, uh, outlined the loops into tab, uh, separate test functions, such that the uh, loop ranges are parameterized into the function uh, arguments. So at the runtime, when a scheduler tries to run a parallel for loop, it just invoked multiple copies of the same test functions, supplying the loop, uh, loop ranges. However, for heartbeat scheduling, that's not the case because it invoke homogeneous, this is what we call homogeneous task. For heartbeat scheduling, that's not the case because if you're simply invoking uh, loops that are homogeneous, supplying the loop iterations, we have missing computations. What do I mean? In this case, look at what case at processing the matrix at the beginning, we do some initial results, processing the rows, and then we write the results. The homogeneous task, now here the missing computation is the result, which is not covered by any of the homogeneous tasks. So, and this is the fundamental reason uh, why Harvey scheduling is so complex because it, try, uh, it requires invoking tasks that are heterogeneous during split, which uh, mismatch with all your existing parallelizing compilers workflow. Uh, and this challenging has never been studied before. So our solution uh, in HPC identifies this challenge uh, by gener uh, for generating heterogeneous tasks. And we define the computation from where an inner, loops, uh, an inner loop will get to split it till the an outer loop that gets, uh, uh, sorry, from an inner loop that gets heartbeat till the uh, uh, next iteration of the outer loop that gets, uh, gets split it as the leftover computation. And uh, we, we generate a second type of task called a leftover task. Uh, which can be invoked at the, uh, by a scheduler at the program runtime. So uh, as you can imagine, for a simple nested for loop, uh, we have uh, one type of level over tasks. But the problem is, uh, is when you have a more complex loop structure, in this case, uh, a seven parallel for loops, the thing is you are going to hand, because of the dynamic nature of hobby scheduling, you have so many level of tasks to generate. How many you have to generate? So support, uh, suppose you have a nest, uh, loop nesting tree, of level D and uh, we denote S max represent the maximum sibling loops uh, across all the uh, loops netting levels. The total number of leftover tasks is bounded by these square times S max. That's so much. So uh, this is too much an ask from the programmer to generate that. And uh, I know that because I go, go exactly through this process, uh, spending quite a amount of time, uh, endless like nights generating tasks and maintaining them. So the good thing is now, which is we see, we automate this process for you and which it's a huge reduction of the works uh, from the programmer. Okay, for the time constraint, I'm not gonna show the, uh, so we have uh, two algorithms uh, to generate all the tasks, but for time constraint, I'm going to, not going to go to the de uh, detail about that. So, okay, uh, the, th the second thing I'm going to talk about uh, is heartbeat delivery. Rem uh, remember from our uh, execution model, we have this uh, constant interval, uh, which we call heartbeat every time we need, um, we need to generate parallelism. So the problem is how you can uh, stop uh, your running program by a heartbeat. How can you implement this? Well, it turns out that there are two ways. Well, the first is hardware interrupt. You can have set, a, set an inter interrupt that interrupts your running programs on time, you can think of like an alarm alerts you. A second one, instead of passively receiving heartbeats from the interrupt, you can actively pull in to see whether I got a heartbeat or not. Okay, you might wonder why we talk about software pulling in, in this case. It's obviously true that uh, hardware interrupt is definitely a better approach. Well, we think that uh, we saw this at the beginning as well, but our results shows, show this counterintuitively that software pulling can be as competitive or have same uh, 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 performance against a uh, using hardware interrupt. Here's what I mean. If you right now, if you use the uh, pin thread implementation with the state state of the art implementation in Linux, <laughs> software pulling actually wins 
other words, so we want to see, then we want to see what's going on with the underlying is it because too many players involved so that the overhead skyrocketed. So we develop, uh, developed a dedicated kernel module just for delivering heartbeats. And in this case, heartbeat software poolings uh, achieve the same performance with that. So why is software pooling better? <laughs> Our evaluation shows that uh, one pooling event takes only around 50 cycles. However, for one uh, hardware interrupts, it takes at least 38 cycles in your best case. That's two order of magnitude difference. So even if we pull 10 times, the performance, uh, the, the, uh, the gap is still huge. So what's the best case? So if in the best case, you magically know when to do the, uh, the software pooling, then the, then the overhead is tiny. But the reality is, you do not know when a heartbeat will, uh, will arrive uh, during the program execute. So you cannot uh, pull only once. So um, you have to pull multiple times. Then the, the thing is you need to pull less often. So how do we do it? Uh, instead of pulling every ad every iteration of the loop, we instead pull at every X iterations. So this is done by do loop chunking uh, in the compiler, uh, in the, uh, by the compiler. So the question now then becomes, What's the X? How can we uh, effectively reduce the number of pooling events to achieve uh, performance gain, uh, to give you better performance? Well, in our paper, we find out that uh, we use a mechanism, uh, we, we develop a mechanism called adaptive chunking, which changes your uh, chunk size dynamically uh, corresponding to your underlying workloads. Uh, so here, the gray bar represents the, uh, the workloads and the red line denotes the changes of the chunk size. So, Yes, so for this, uh, for that, uh, we uh, in HBC, we have both mechanisms enabled, but the software pooling is the default one we use for that. Okay, so this concludes my talk. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, uh, this, this work, of course, uh, from so many uh, authors, I especially thank you to my advisor, Simone Kimpanoli, and uh, this work cannot be done without me. And also, uh, happy birthday, yes. Thank you. Yeah, great talk. I was just wondering, how do you know what to set the heartbeat interval to? Like, does does that make sense? You mean like in the uh, software pooling case, or it's in the uh... like then you know you're you're doing like a heartbeat. I think in your figure you had every three blocks. Why did you choose three instead of five? And so oh yes, so this is a uh, this is a runtime heuristics it can be configured once before your program runs. Uh, it's a yeah, of, often the case there's a one tuning case that uh, there's some perform uh, there's some uh, uh, tuning process you need to go through. But the thing is, only you need to go through it once. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, uh, I have a question about code size. So you've shown that uh, those uh, seven nested loops or something like that, and if you calculate the coefficient, there's like 27 different leftover tasks. So I was wondering on, the, on your workloads, what's like the code size impact of generating the code for all of those leftovers? Yes, uh, so we did not do the exact evaluations over that, but uh, the leftover task often invokes, because you have those homogeneous tasks, so in the leftover task, most of the time you just we the leftover tasks are the wrappers uh, over those homogeneous tasks. Okay. So uh, we don't expect that you have a, a huge like quadratic blow, uh, blow of the code size. And in real life workloads, what are approximate values of the DNS here? Like, what's the yeah, then... yeah the on the slide? Are you say three and seven? Is it like a representative for the real life uh, loop or? Yes, yes, we we were we're seeing corner, uh, we we're seeing uh, benchmarks uh, have those kind of like uh, complex loops. Right? Okay, thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker. Well, last thing, this is my personal ask. This is my first uh, conference presentation, so I really want to take a photo with all of you uh, as a presenter. So, is that okay? I will just take a selfie here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.